Hey guys, so today I'm going to talk about topological insulators. These are a class of electrical insulators in condensed matter physics, whose mathematical underpinning turns out to have a lot to do with the field of, well, topology. Here, one studies equivalency classes of objects based on the presence or absence of continuous deformations between them. You can think of, for example, the circle and the square. In this case, it's straightforward to see that there exists a continuous deformation between them, so that they're said to be topologically equivalent, and that they belong to the same topological equivalency class. The triangle also belongs to this equivalency class. So does the hexagon or any 2D shape really, since they can all be continuously deformed into each other. Well, are there shapes which these can't be continuously deformed into? Are there other distinct topological equivalency classes? The answer to that question turns out to depend on the details of the topological space. In our case, let's assume that there's a hole in the topological space, and let's draw a circle around that hole. Now this circle can still be continuously deformed into a square or any other 2D shape which also has a hole in its center. The problem arises when you try continuously deforming these shapes into shapes which don't have holes in their centers since there is no way to do this really without ripping or tearing something which would correspond to a discontinuous transformation. For this reason, shapes with holes in their centers are said to be topologically distinct, and that they belong to a distinct topological equivalency class. Now you can repeat this procedure for two or three or an infinite number of holes, ultimately giving you a set whose elements are characterized by an integer, representing the number of holes inside the shapes. Now this integer is called the topological invariant of the shapes, and it can be shown quite generally that there always exists a bijective mapping between the set spanned by this topological invariant, in our case the integers, and the set of topological equivalency classes. For this reason, you're free to think either in terms of the topological invariant itself, or equivalently in terms of the shapes that it represents. Okay, so this is pretty cool, but what does it have to do with physics? Well, remember that we're talking about condensed matter physics, not just physics generally. If you're not familiar with condensed matter physics, then this is a subfield of physics which basically studies everyday objects, like the graphite found in your pencil or the silicon found in most transistors. These are crystalline systems, and they can therefore be modeled by a periodic array of atoms whose valence electrons are more or less localized around their parent atoms, but which are allowed to hop with some non-zero probability between neighboring atoms. Now you can write down the equations of motion for this system in the second quantized Hamiltonian formalism, and if you diagonalize this Hamiltonian, then you'll get an equation which tells you what the allowed energies of these valence electrons are, as a function of, say, momentum. Now if you plot out these energy levels, you'll get a dispersion relation, which will exhibit a discretization of the energy levels as a result of the quantum Hamiltonian that we started with. However, if you assume that the length of the system is much, much larger than the typical interatomic spacing, as it usually is, then the spacing between consecutive momentum values, which goes like one over the length, becomes so small that you can basically approximate this dispersion as a continuous function called the band structure. This band structure is basically a visual representation of what the allowed quantum states are as a function of momentum. Now this band structure may or may not have a gap at some point, but if it does, then this turns out to have important ramifications on the transport properties of the material. To understand why, let me first define something called the Fermi level, as the energy at which the highest energy electron exists. You can think of gradually filling up the band structure with electrons. The last electron to enter the band structure lies at the Fermi level. Now let's place our Fermi level inside the gap and let's think about perturbing this system with some characteristic energy scale. If the magnitude of the gap is much larger than this characteristic energy scale, then there's a sense in which the electron simply won't respond to the perturbation, because it's not giving them enough energy to jump the gap and reach the next available quantum energy state. This results in electrically insulating behavior in the special case of the perturbation corresponding to an applied voltage bias, and the response being the motion of the electrons. Now the opposite end of this extreme is of course the gapless case, which would result in electrically conducting behavior by virtue of the fact that for all values of the Fermi level, there's always an infinitesimally close quantum energy state for the electrons to respond with. Okay, but let's focus for the moment on the insulators, that is after all the purpose of the talk. And let's think about things topologically. 
This amounts to asking what are the topological equivalency classes associated with continuous deformations of the underlying Hamiltonian. Now, the answer to this question turns out to be not so obvious, but researchers have shown that you can get some idea about the nature of the topological invariant, assuming you know some basic information about the insulator. In particular, it's dimensionality, along with the presence or absence of time reversal symmetry, which takes time to minus itself, particle hole symmetry, which exchanges filled and empty states, and sublattice symmetry, which is defined as the composition of the prior two operations. With this, you can determine whether your topological invariant is an element of the set Z2, which is the integers mod 2, whether it's an element of the trivial set, which is basically just 0, or whether it's an element of the integers, as we saw in our first example. For concreteness, I'll pick one of these classes, say a two-dimensional class which breaks time reversal symmetry but preserves particle hole symmetry. This might correspond to something like a monolayer of graphene in an externally applied magnetic field, but in any case, the topological invariant in this system can be written down as the Chern number, which is physically defined as the integral of the Berry curvature over momentum space. Now, this Berry curvature is interesting in its own right, and definitely worth looking into. But for our purposes, all we really need to know is that this topological invariant depends on two things. The first is the number of filled states, and the second is the mathematical structure of those filled states. Now, we will only be concerned with adiabatic transformations, which are defined as transformations which do preserve their structure. So, we're really only left with one thing, which is the number of filled states. What this means is that if we want to maintain our topological character, embodied by the topological invariant, then we're free to deform our Hamiltonian and its underlying band structure in any way that we want, so long as we don't cross the Fermi level or equivalently, close the gap. The converse of the statement is also true. If we do want to change our topological invariant, then we must first necessarily close the gap, and then maybe reopen it. This results in one of the most awesome statements about topological insulators generally, which is the presence of gapless edge states on them. Gapless, we know, means conducting, and edge states are just states which are localized at the edge, or a boundary. In two dimensions, this would correspond to something like 1D wire states, and in three dimensions, two-dimensional surface states. Now, to see that you must get these gapless edge states on non-trivial topological insulators is a fairly straightforward task once you realize that the vacuum has nothing in it, and is therefore topologically trivial with a topological invariant of zero. This means that if you place a non-trivial topological invariant inside the vacuum, you'll be left with the boundary over which the topological invariant changes from something zero to something non-zero. But we know that if we want to change the topological invariant, we must first close the gap, giving you gapless states which are localized on this boundary, or gapless edge states. So this is cool. What this means is that the result of all this awesome and cool theory is to basically give you something to test. We've made a prediction about the existence of gapless edge states on topological insulators, and this is something that we can probe experimentally. So how would you do this? Well, there are of course a multitude of ways that you can do it, but I'll pick two. The first is the temperature dependence. How would the temperature dependence of certain observable quantities, like for example the resistance, change in the presence of gapless edge states? Well, to answer this, let's first think about the behavior of the traditional insulator. In this case, the band structure is gapped and the Fermi level lies inside this gap. At sufficiently low temperatures, this corresponds to insulating behavior, but at sufficiently high temperatures, thermal energy can kick electrons over the gap, giving rise to some sort of semiconducting behavior. Not quite insulating, but not quite conducting either. As a result, the high temperature resistance is a bit lower than the low temperature resistance, giving you a curve which would embody this. Okay, so how does this change in the presence of gapless edge states? Well, in this case, you'd have to superimpose the gapless dispersion on top of the original insulating band structure. Now, it turns out that at sufficiently high temperatures, this doesn't really change much because the thermal energy kicks electrons upwards and makes them mostly interact with the original band structure anyways. However, at sufficiently low temperatures, the electrons are forced to live inside the gap, and now you have a gapless dispersion, which provides an additional mode for conduction which shouldn't really have ever been there in the first place. This results in a net reduction of the measured resistance at sufficiently low temperatures, and a modification to the curve that can be measured. In fact, this is exactly what was measured in the prototypical topological insulator 
bismuth selenide. So that's already one hint at the existence of topological edge states. The other comes from the magnetic field dependence. In this case, instead of exploiting the band structure of the system, we can think simply in terms of its dimensionality. In particular, if you have a three-dimensional topological insulator, then you should have two-dimensional gapless edge states, so that we can ask what, if any, are the unique features of two-dimensional electrons exposed to a magnetic field. Well, if the magnetic field is perpendicular to the two-dimensional plane, then this should induce a centrifugal force given by the Lorentz equation, which will push the electrons into a circular orbit. In the quantum regime, the energies associated with these orbits are, of course, quantized, giving you a dispersion relation whose energy levels are all spaced apart, with a spacing that depends on the strength of the magnetic field. This is basically a gapped system, and if the Fermi level lies inside of one of these gaps, then you'll get a highly resistive response, as usual. This results in a periodic dependence of the conductivity on the value of the Fermi level, giving us something that we can measure. Now it's important to note at this point that the argument so far depends on the two-dimensionality of the electrons. If they had lived in three dimensions, then this extra degree of freedom would induce helical orbits as opposed to circular ones, broadening the energy spectrum and killing the robust periodicity that we would otherwise have. So, if we were to observe this periodicity in nature, it would be a pretty strong indication of the two-dimensional nature of the gapless edge states. And what do you know? This is again exactly what was observed in the topological insulator, bismuth selenide. Okay, so we now have decent evidence for the existence of topological edge states. This should in turn provide some motivation for the validity of its underlying theory. And this is good, because it turns out that the electronic structure of insulators in general is actually not very well understood. So it's good that we can apparently infer the existence of some non-trivial topological invariant, which represents some quantity or some feature that doesn't change upon continuous deformations, just by looking at very simple things like the dimensionality or the symmetries that the insulator respects. This is awesome, because it provides a huge leap towards understanding insulators in a very simple and general way. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you found this as cool as I did. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you guys next time. Ciao! Okay, real talk. I want to give a shout out to everyone in the Discord. Thanks so much, Wuffles, for helping me set this up. Thanks, Weldy, for expressing an interest in physics and all these cool and awesome things. And thanks everybody else for just being there. I know I haven't really streamed in a while, and I'm sorry about that. I'm just super busy, but it's nice to keep up. So yeah, stay cute.